with you that I was going to be speaking for the church in New York, but I couldn't remember the name. And so forgive me, uh, my friend, I know you texted, and um, the old man sometimes has his hands full. So I just stepped from that pulpit to drink some water when I saw my sister calling. And I know my sister knows that at this point I would be preaching. You ever hear that your heart skipped a beat? My mind went straight to something that I know I'll have to face sometime in the future, but I'm not ready for it. I have loving sisters, one of whom stays with my mother. And when I saw her calling, at the point she was calling just about five minutes ago, I knew it was a strange time to call. And my heart raced, my blood pressure went past the ceiling, and my mind went out of whack because I'm expecting to tell me that something is wrong with mommy. But then she asked me to pray for her. I wrote it down on whatever I had nearby my hands. It's right here. She has, she, my sister works at the Black River Hospital and her work mate Suzette from Mountainside just found her brother dead. And um, it's a world where sudden sad news seem to become our everyday companion. And so Suzette and the family in Mountainside, our family here in West Jamaica, will have you in prayer. I don't know what it feels like. I can't imagine fully, nor can I understand. But I know this, that there is a God whose shoulder is strong enough and broad enough, whose hands are powerful enough to hold all of us, to embrace, to console, to empower, to comfort. And whilst I can't imagine what you and your family must be going through at this time, while I can't say I understand, I can say you can trust the living God to find consolation, comfort, and hope. You are in our prayers and our thoughts, even at this time. And I'll pray for you in a moment or two. I'd like also to thank God for the recovery being experienced by many who have fallen ill either by COVID or by natural course of illness and all its concomitant evils. I praise his name for the recovery being experienced by Mother Hines, by Everett from Burn Savannah, Taylor. And sandwiched between all of that is yet another sad news of the sudden death close to my own family, my wife's cousins uh, lost her husband by sudden death either last night or this morning. And so, to the family, we extend our deepest condolences. Oh, how we traverse the valley in the shadow of death. And so, the Black River Church and its offices, we join you in mourning, even in this moment. Let us pray. O thou who hearest every heartfelt prayer, the one on whom in affliction we call, our comfort by day and night, our song in the midnight hour, 
our solace and our sanctuary, a place to hide from savage suffering and senseless grief. We come to you this moment trusting in the love of a God who is too loving to be unkind, whose mercies are from everlasting to everlasting. And so I lift up our cousins, the family to you. We lift up Suzette and her family to you. We lift up other families now mourning the loss of loved ones. We pray, O oh God of Israel, that you would do what only God Almighty can do. And after you would have comforted, after you would have carried them through grief and sorrow, we ask even for something else that you would hasten the day when death itself shall die. Hasten the day, Lord, when the everlasting gospel will be preached to the ends of the earth and the kingdoms of this world would have become your kingdom. When the earth will be filled with the glory of God as waters cover the rolling seas. When Eden lost would be restored. When truth shall envelop the earth and God and man shall dwell together again never more to part. Bless your words to our hearts. Touch this feeble, frail, fickle lump of mortal clay. Give not only physical strength, spiritual strength, mental clarity, but give to a sinful servant that which you want done for this moment in the preaching that is now necessary is our asking in Jesus' name, and together we say, Amen. Uh, before I get into the Word, I just slip, saw a note slipped on the pulpit. Uh, someone who's been watching the Footprints of Hope series was supposed to have been Uh, I struggle even in reading this and I hope it is no it, I saw that what I, what I am fearful to read is the last part so if you're verifying that my communications director uh, but someone who was watching Footprints of Hope who was supposed to have been baptized at the North Street Church today, died this morning. Uh, if I would get a name of the family so we could at least lift up the family in prayer, but I know that the North Street family would have this covered. We're joined together by the everlasting gospel, and so to our sister's family in North Street, be mindful that the same prayer we pray for the others, we pray for you. Do you know I couldn't help but think, as I, I paused, not because I couldn't read it, but because I would not, for, 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 for the sheer shock. But as I paused, my mind raced to the thief on the cross, who never had a chance to be baptized, but who had the assurance of salvation, because he surrendered to Jesus even on the cross and so our sister who should have been baptized God in his loving kindness sealed that decision and death cannot take that away oh may the living God even in these tragic circumstances speak to some heart somebody some pastor some member some some elders, some, some, somebody, someplace. You've been hearing the truth of the living God. You've been hearing the Bible. You've been hearing the grace of God expounded. You've been hearing the commandments of God declared. After all this while, why are you halting? After all this while, why are you still resisting? After all this while, I trust you'll make your calling an election sure. And so, uh, 
in the midst of all of this, I told you last night, I got a text from my batchmate and friend, Pastor Roosevelt Marsden, who texted me last night that somebody will be driving for six hours today to be baptized at his church, having watched the Footprints of Hope series, and now made up his mind to be baptized. I don't know the time difference between there and here, but I trust by the grace of God that uh, all will be well as you make the decision to surrender to Christ. We thank God for what he's doing across the world, not just from this podium, but from pulpits across the world where the truth is being declared. And so today, I'd like to take your attention. Well, before I do that, uh, this coming Sabbath, I will be joining with my professor and teacher at school. He taught there whilst I was at West Indies College, Dr. Newton Hoylett, pastor now in Lehigh. And so I'll be joining him in his pulpit for an evangelistic program starting on Sabbath coming. And then I'll be joining some others at a later date, but my friend and brother, Dr. Alanza Smith, I will share those uh, flyers with you. I thought I had them lined up, but I won't give my tech team any trouble. I'll share those flyers with you this afternoon in preparation uh, for the mentorship program. I'll share with you those programs as we seek to spread the everlasting gospel in Lapin life across the length and breadth of the world. I welcome you this morning back to this place. And I did tell, is it Mount Zion, that I will welcome you. You are anxious to get here, and so uh, we're together twice for the morning. It's good to have you join us. Have you ever been there where you plunge from the mountaintop to the valley? Have you ever been there when the spiritual resources seem to have run low and your emotional reservoir seem empty. And even though you may have some physical and mental agility, yet you've plunged to that place. There seem to be this unending, continuous saga of moving from the mountaintop to stuff in the valley. There seemed to be this, this challenge that comes. And I may not get to the end of the sermon, so let me tell you where my mind is at. Do you remember when the, Jesus went up on the mount with Peter, James, and John, and the other disciples were down at the foot of the mountain? And a man brought a sick in need of spiritual and physical healing. And the disciples were in a valley, and so they couldn't handle it. Do you recall many of the ancient prophets, both in the Old and New Testament, who plunged from high to a low. I may not get to finish the sermon, so let me tell you where I'm going. Can you recall Jesus declaring about his own death and his mission when he said, for this cause came I into the world. For this cause came I. I came to give my life a ransom for many. Can you recall Christ making those statements and then hear him in the garden of Gethsemane crying, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Can you recall Jesus saying, I came to give my life a ransom for many. Can you hear him then on Calvary's cross uttering the words of Psalm 22 verse 1? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Have you ever been there where you've moved from the mountain top to the valley? Have you ever been there where almost inexplicably you can deal with the sudden sunrise to sunset orchestration of extremes? 
You would wish to be on the valley and the mountain rather, but the valley pulls you down. And, and sometimes, particularly I say this for our new believers, sometimes in our valley encounter, the devil would warn you to think that you have abandoned Christ or that God has abandoned you. Sometimes when, when, when your money is acting funny and, and all your friends seem to be uncaring and unfeeling, sometimes when, when in the midst of your doing your best, the worst happens uh, that the devil would make you want to think that God does not care or that you have abandoned or like Job when you plunge in the midst of the controversy and you, you're losing the stuff that, that once give you joy, you're losing your children, you're losing your family, you're losing everything and you're about to lose your life, life itself and some would make you want to think that you've done some great sin while this is happening. I will use as a subject today from Carmel to the cave, divine purpose and human perplexities. Our message is entitled from Carmel to the cave, divine purpose and human perplexities. Would you turn your Bibles with me to the book of James? I take you to a, a New Testament text. When you get to my age, you find that you can't do without your glasses. And, uh, well, I don't have it with me, so I'm going to have to do without it. But we go to James. James chapter 5. And we are going to begin reading at verse 17. That Hebrews, and then comes James, the fifth chapter. And the 17th verse said, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not. It rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any one of you do err, from the truth and one convert him let him know that he who converts the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sin my interest in this pericope is the 17th verse Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain and it rained not for three years and six months jump with me to first kings chapter 19 first kings the 19th chapter, 1 Kings chapter 19, you have 1st and 2nd Samuel, then you have 1 Kings, you have the 19th chapter, and I want to take you to the 13th verse, that's 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 13. And it was so. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What? 
doest thou hear? Elijah, what a question. What doest thou hear? What doest thou hear? Elijah, it's a New Testament text, the text in James. And I want to take you back there. And if we have some time, we'll come back to 1 Kings 19. So it's a New Testament text. Elijah was a man subject to like passion. As we are. I'm going to ask my friend in the tech room if you can work with me closely. We go to James chapter 5. We go back to verse 17. If you'll hear me clearly, my friends in the tech room. In 1 Kings 5 and verse 17, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not in the earth. It rained not in the earth by the space of three years and six months. There was famine everywhere. Our text is a New Testament text from an Old Testament story where theological, sociological, and socio-religio-political implications Take us to the end of time. The sociological, the theological, and the socio-religio-political implications of the story of 1 Kings 18 and 19 take us to the very end of time. Can you allow me then to take my time there are three things three statements I'd like to use as a foundation the theological context of our text in James there is a divine purpose that is designed in the divine human partnership in this God and man relationship, there is a divine purpose. While you listen to me, while you share in this worship service, don't allow your mind to escape from the theological context of James 5, 17. The preacher is shaping the sermon in the sense that you ought to understand there is a divine purpose for your life in the midst of your sociological construct. God has a purpose for your life. I'm going to say it again. In this New Testament text, and its Old Testament context. There is a theological principle that screams out at us that in the play and counterplay of human history, there is a divine purpose in the partnership between God and man. I did say to you that the text also has sociological implications. Sociologically, humanity without God is nothing. God without man is still all-powerful, still all-sufficient, still omnipotent, still omniscient. God without man is still God satisfied in his own self-sufficiency with life unborrowed and underived. God 
without the universe was still and is still and will always be God. But man without God is insufficient, helpless, and hopeless. There is a sociological understanding that this New Testament text in its Old Testament context seeks to voice itself on our understanding. The third piece in this tripartite construct of our message is that there is a socio-religio-political alliance. Listen to the preacher. Mankind, misguided, unfettered, blind ambition, and its impact, its impact on his society. I'm going to say it again. Mankind in his unfettered, blind ambition, in his false sense of security that he can live his life without God, it has an impact, serious impact on his environment on his surroundings, on the issues. Unlike Midal in the primary school story, everything he touches does not turn to gold. Everything that's touched by a sinful human being has the great potential to unleash sorrow and sickness and virus and destruction whilst he thinks he is self-sufficient. Secondly, religion without deep rooted biblical faith jumps out at us in the story of 1 Kings 18 and 19. Thirdly, politics and politicians without principle, ethics, and biblical morality can be not only a threat to themselves but a threat to their society. Hear the preacher, politics and politicians without principle, ethics, and biblical morality. Look at the Old Testament story and what you find is a union of misguided sociology, unbiblical religiosity, and a king without ethics or morality joined together and the rest 854 prophets and all of God's faithful children are deemed as public enemies Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are this New Testament text has its roots in an Old Testament story. Follow the preacher. I'm taking my time and I'm going someplace. Elijah, this prophet, has left a mark so that when Jesus asked the question of his disciples, whom do men say that I am? Their first response was, some say that you are Elijah. What did Jesus say about John the Baptist? Did he not say, this is Elijah which was to come? For Old Testament people, so impacted by the issues of Mount Carmel, so impacted by the stuff of Elijah, one man as it were in his own thinking against an army. But there's something here in the text that preachers like myself and members of God's church must understand. What did Elijah say? Elijah, when God asked him, what are you doing? He said, I am the only one left. Hear me carefully. God has his children scattered across the length and breadth of the world. Some are drunkards right now. Some are prostitutes right now. 
there are good people and bad people in every church but hear the preacher the same way Elijah gave a strident call the Lord hallelujah the Lord God Almighty in these closing days is calling all true red blooded Bible based believers to come back to nothing else but the plain verse said the Lord God that's why ancient people would talk about an Elijah message that must be preached before the coming of the Lord and so when John the Baptist came preaching they had a problem with him Holy Ghost help the preacher. There's so much wrapped up in this word. And that clock on the wall is giving me, giving me high blood pressure. Listen to me carefully. I haven't forgotten my subject. From Carmel to the cave. The divine purpose and human perplexities. Listen to me carefully. No matter how spiritually minded we are, every now and then we are afflicted by the perplexities of our sinful nature. And so Elijah to the cave, John the Baptist in the prison. What did John send to us, Jesus? The same John who was anointed with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. The same John who, whilst he was in his mother's womb, in the womb of Elizabeth, when Mary came up, the baby inside Elizabeth's womb jumped. There is a divine purpose in this God-man partnership. That a baby inside its mother's womb filled up with the Holy Ghost could recognize that in the womb of the next woman is the Messiah. I'm talking about from Carmel to the cave, the divine purpose and human perplexity. Walk with the preacher. So the same John anointed with the Holy Ghost from inside his mother's womb. The same John who on the banks of Jordan raised his index finger with an outstretched right hand and said, there he is, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The same John who preached fiery sermons so that soldiers and priests and people would trek their way out in the wilderness he had no handbills he had no facebook he had no youtube he had no whatsapp stuff he had no flyer all he had was just a straightforward thus said the lord god and even out in the wilderness sinners knew that something was different about the word he preached something was different about the message he brings and they found their way out in the wilderness and he asked them bring forth fruits for repentance the same John the same John locked up in prison the divine purpose and human perplexities so in prison I think it's Matthew 11 he sent to ask Jesus a question what do you do when Jesus does not operate the way you think he should. What do you do when the stuff you want him to do, he doesn't do it? What do you do when, when the way and the time in which you want him to act, he does not act in that way, he does not act on your timing. What do you do? And so, I think it's, John, it's Matthew 11 that, that he sent to ask Jesus a question. Here's the question. Are you the promised Messiah or should we look for another? The same John, let me take you back. Let me take you back. The same John filled with the Holy Ghost inside his mother's womb. The same baby 
that leaped in the mother's womb when Mary and Elizabeth came together. The same John who baptized Jesus. The same John who introduced Jesus. Are you Jesus, the promised Messiah? Or should we look for another? The divine purpose and human perplexity. Can I go deeper with this? The issue of our human perplexity and the divine purpose is even made potent. What did happen when the angel came to the parents of John to declare that God in his divine purpose was going to bring forth a child in their old age? Ah, God had to demonstrate his displeasure at the unbelief of John the Baptist's father because the day the angel spoke to him and he said it can't be he became dumb until the baby was born it was not until the time of the christening allow me to make a phrase that when they asked what shall we name him somebody said ask his father and then they said but no he hasn't spoken in nine months and the first thing he said was his name shall be John I'm talking about the divine purpose and human perplexity. I'm talking about the saga from the mountain top of our spiritual height to the cave of despondency and the cave of discouragement and the cave of depression. Your cave has not killed the power and the purpose of the living God. Hear the preacher. Hear the preacher. I'm talking now to a new believer. You will have moments of discouragement. You may even have moments when the folk in the church that you look up to may let you down. I'm talking about a divine purpose in the midst of your human perplexity. From Carmel to the cave are issues not just for his time, but their theological, their sociological, and their socio religio political implications will last until the very second coming of Jesus Christ. Elijah was a man subject to like passions. John the Baptist's father was a man subject to like passion here comes an angel with a message from God but whatever his misconceptions John the Baptist's father had unbelief can I go further with this there is a correlation between this Elijah and what we call the Elijah message so when Christ was speaking about John the Baptist, of his fearless, undiluted message of how the powers, political powers, socio-religio political powers were stocked up against John the Baptist. They arrested him. They threw him in jail. He ended up losing his head cut off his head and placed his head in a plate carried on the dance floor because the powers of religion and politics and sociology stalked out against God's messenger but I stopped by the pulpit just to tell somebody even if death take your life death will not hallelujah death will not have the last word there is a God who says I am the resurrection and the life he who believes in me though he were dead yet shall he live Hear the preacher, from Carmel to the cave, 
the divine purpose and human perplexities. So let me go further. John, in the reflection of Jesus, was said to be, when, when Jesus was doing his eulogy on John, he made a profound statement. He said, this is Elijah which was to come. What a statement. You see, the last Old Testament prophet declared, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He shall preach the truth. He shall turn the hearts of fathers back to their sons. He shall turn Israel back to his God. This is Elijah. Listen. The Elijah message comes against the background of the fearlessness of that human being with a divine purpose. Now, now, now walk with me, walk with me. I don't want to lose you. So, so walk closely. Don't follow me like Peter. If you follow afar off, you're going to get in trouble. So hang on to my coattail. Hang on to your Bible rather and follow me closely. So if you're following me closely, type in the chat, I'm following you preacher. Encourage my heart and say, I'm with you preacher. Huh? And call up your neighbor, tell them, tell them, you can't miss the next 27 minutes or more. So, the last Old Testament prophet says, before the coming of the Messiah, I will send you Elijah. So here Jesus, in the eulogy on John the Baptist, he said, this is Elijah which was for to come. So it's not the man Elijah, it's the Elijah message. Well, what is the Elijah message? Well, the first, I'm glad you asked me. I'm anxious to tell you in my first statement, it is a rather unpopular and unloved message. But it is more so a God-sent message. It's a biblical message. It is not dependent on the acceptance of the religious majority. It is not even dependent on the acceptance of the sociological majority. It is dependent on God. His truth. So Jesus knew that John the Baptist was a unique fellow. His diet was plant-based. Hello? His diet was strange. He himself was strange. I'm not talking about dress reform, but I can't help but saying it. His dressing was unique. I'm going to leave you to walk with that wherever you want to go with it. But his message was God sent, biblically rooted. And he knew he was not in a popularity context. He knew that the force of his message would make him unliked or unloved by the powerful in his society. So Jesus said, this is Elijah which was for to come. He spoke of John the Baptist. So you have to understand it was not the coming in flesh of the real man Elijah. It was the message, the context, the principle of the divine purpose. But there's something that, that excites my mind and at the same time bothers my mind. Because you see, John the Baptist in order to perform his function was filled up with the Holy Ghost. You cannot speak the whole truth unless you are guided by the Holy Ghost. Listen to me carefully. If you are not 
Holy Ghost guided. You're going to give a watered down version of the gospel of Christ. If you are not Holy Ghost filled, you're going to give a popularity liking message. But if, what did Jesus say would be the role of the Holy Ghost? He said he will guide you into all truth. And that includes obedience to God's Ten Commandments. That includes the declaration of the Seventh Day Sabbath. That includes the wide range rafter of eating right and drinking right and dressing right and living right. I'm taking my time. So walk with the preacher. I tell you, I was excited and troubled at the same time. I'm excited that the divine God would condescend to use human agency for the fulfillment of his divine purpose. I'm excited that God would come down to our level because we can get up to his and would give us this awesome place to play in presenting the gospel, the salvation gospel, the soul-saving gospel, the societal transforming gospel. Listen to me carefully. It'll shake up kingdoms. It'll lift up the fallen. But it will humble the proud. It will pull down the mighty. Follow the preacher. It excites me and it bothers me. It bothers me that you and I can be Holy Ghost filled today. And our sociological context can cause us to plunge from Carmel to the cave. It bothers me that, that sin affects us so deeply. That even though we've been God called and God sent and Holy Ghost directed, if we're not careful, our humanity will get in the way of God's divine purpose. Plunging us from Carmel to the cave. I don't know where you're at or who you are, but there's a word here for you. Listen to me. John the Baptist, his mission was to prepare the world for the first coming of Jesus. We talk about the Elijah message. And we said that Jesus said, this is Elijah, we were supposed to come. That was present truth. But there is a present truth with the same implications. It's the proclamation of Revelation 14, 6 to 12, the everlasting gospel with a fearlessness and a forthrightness and a biblical rootedness declared just as Elijah and John the Baptist had declared it in their time and their context. But there's something that bothers my mind. John the Baptist's father didn't believe all the parts that the angel declared. John the Baptist's role was to prepare the world for the first coming of Jesus. John the Baptist had a divine purpose. The remnant church, the last part of God's truth, has the same role like Elijah and John the Baptist, the founding fathers to whom this word came after an apostate system covered the earth with darkness, the doctrines of mankind and the teachings of an apostate system that has no basis in the Bible. Three groups came out of that great disappointment. Some turned back. Never again to believe. Some broke away to raise up a misguided brand. But a second group, a third group said, they listened to the text, thou must prophesy again. And they went back and back and back, reading and studying Organizing and praying, they found their connection, acknowledged their mistake, and they rose up. Out of which came the remnant movement. Ah, there's something about the divine purpose and human perplexity. The disciples spent three years plus with Jesus. They ate with him. They walked with him. He taught them. And yet at his death, they did not believe everything he said. And in Luke 24, on the road to Emmaus, they spoke about him as if their hope was dead and done for. Hear the preacher. The text 
James 5.17 is a New Testament text from an Old Testament story with sociological, theological, and political implications. Can I talk with you? Oh, my mind is disturbed. For Elijah, the political kingdom led by Ahab, a religious apostasy led by Jezebel, and the people, the people of Israel, who should have known better, but because they had abandoned God's covenant, because they had abandoned the altar, they gave wings to falsehood, creeping inside God's remnant. Hear the preacher, Ahab, Jezebel, and the false prophets led a nation to a place where God had to shut up heaven. No rain. The environment suffer. Animals suffer. Humankind suffer. No rain, no dew for three years and six months because they abandoned the true worship of the Lord God Jehovah. From Carmel to the cave, wish I had time, the divine purpose and human perplexity. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. Hear the preacher. That phrase highlights the perplexity, the potential of humanity breaking in on God's purpose. And yet, in spite of his frail humanity, he walked into Ahab's presence and said, I think it's 1 Kings 17, there shall neither, you know the text, in, I think it's 1 Kings 17, Elijah the Tishbite, nothing about his father or his mother, because God was not focusing on his paternal connection, God's focus was on the message and the mission. Elijah broke in and said, as the Lord God liveth, this church has got to understand it must be faithful to its divine purpose and its divine message, regardless of how widely entrenched truth may be, regardless of how widely opposed truth may be, regardless of how defended error may be, regardless that political alignment may fall in line with religious apostasy. The remnant church has a mission and a message. It's the everlasting gospel. It's God's purpose. And hear this preacher, the hour is coming when the same threat to Elijah and the same threat to John the Baptist will be leveled against the remnant church. But our focus is on a divine purpose and God's divine message so, so the prophet was not introduced to us by virtue of his parental background his heritage or his political alliance the text merely says and Elijah the Tishbite who is from Gilead, said to Ahab, as the Lord God liveth. I love the next part. Before whom I stand. <laughs> when you are faced with the frailty of human perplexity that has the potential to derail your divine purpose, you've got to be careful to know that you're standing before God and that you're standing with God and you're standing for God. Are you listening to me? Now, I have the tease here. You read 1 Kings 1 through 17 and you, have ne you will never bump into anything where Elijah said, God, if, if I tell them there won't be no rain, will you shut up the heaven? Look at the text. Look at the text. Look at the story. There was no prior conversation with the prophet and God 
concerning the particularity of this mission. Then it leads, therefore, to one conclusion. It has to be this, that the prophet was so in line with communion with God that every move he made, he had the assurance he was divinely directed. He was divinely led. And now he had the assurance he'll be divinely protected. Walk with me. He said, as the Lord liveth, before whom I stand, there shall neither be rain nor dew. Are you following me? There shall neither be rain nor dew for three years. And he wheel his tail. And he's gone just as he came in. Three years, six months, no rain. Can I take you back to James 5, 17? Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. The fact that you've been born in sin, fashioned in iniquity, is no excuse, nor can it be used to derail or defy or deny God's willingness to use you if you are willing to be used and be led by God. Elijah was a man subject to like passions, but the divine purpose was fulfilled. I'm not done. I'm dancing between Elijah, the original, and John the Baptist in the Elijah message and the remnant church in its divine focus and purpose. So hear the preacher. Walk with me. Elijah, the man. And Mount Carmel, the altar broken down. The king, the political directorate in bed with those who have no divine rootedness. The commandments of God abandoned. The law of God rejected. The altars of true worship torn down. And from pillar to pole, from north to south, from east to west, the only ones left who were faithful had got to go in hiding for their lives. The powers that be sought to lock them up and to shut them up, killing them. And so here we are, on Mount Carmel. What question did this forthright, fearless prophet on the divine purpose ask? He asked the question, and you find it between chapters 18 and how long will you halt between two opinions? If God's words are true, follow them. If the Lord God is God, obey him. There's no time now for a middle ground. Hear me, reverend. Hear me, pastor. Hear me, priest. Hear me, people. We are on the edge of the second coming of Jesus Christ. There's no time now for vacillating like a reed in the wind. There's no time now. How long will you halt between two opinions? How long will you halt between two opinions? How long will you vacillate? You who know better, you who have read the Bible, you know God's Ten Commandments have never been abolished. You know that grace does not free you from obedience. How long will you halt between two opinions? So he said to them, if the Lord God is your God, follow him because you can't fool him. I'm going to run from that. So he asked them to build their altar, to offer their worship, to put their sacrifice, and call on their God. But he settled the issue. He said, before you do that, let's settle this up front. Any God, the God who answers by fire, let him be God. And they said, well spoken. So they built their altar. 
they cut up their sacrifices and they began at the morning sacrifice they went on through the midday sacrifice they went on close to the time of the evening sacrifice they cut themselves they poured their own blood they cut themselves as if their blood could build up merits before the Lord God but no answer came when it was time for the evening sacrifice Elijah said repair the altar of God what did he say he said repair the altar of God Isaiah 58 says they that shall be of the people of God will build back the old waste places thou shalt be called a repairer of the breach a restorer of paths to dwell in could you find the text from your son I think it's Isaiah 58 I think it's 11 10 or 11 I know verse 12 13 talks about if you will turn your foot from the Sabbath from doing your pleasure on God's holy day and call the Sabbath a delight honorable and shall honor him not doing thine own ways nor speaking thine own words nor finding thine own pleasure Isaiah 58 12 says and they that shall be of thee shall build the always places Elijah said Build back the altar. Restore God's covenant. Restore true worship. The last day remnant people. They that shall be of thee. Shall be called the restorer. Of paths to dwell in. That's verse 12. On what basis is that going to be? Verse 13 says. Verse 13 says. Come on son work with me. If thou turn away thy foot. Verse 13 is the continuation of verse 12. They that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. They shall restore the paths and the foundations of many generations. They shall be called a repairer of the breach. A breach has been created. God's commandments has been disposed. God's Sabbath has been replaced by the dark to the mankind but there shall be a remnant people and Elijah message that will build back the old waste places and restore the paths of many generation hallelujah there shall be a John the Baptist in the closing days there shall be the declaration of the everlasting gospel if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath from doing thy pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight the holy of the Lord verse 14 says honorable and shall honor him not doing thine own ways nor finding thine own pleasure nor speaking thine own words verse 14 said then shall thou delight thyself in the Lord and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth I'll feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it I'll feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father what happened to Elijah when he ran from Jezebel but before I get there watch him repairing the altar watch the fire fall he poured water he poured 12 barrels of water on the sacrifice so that the argument can be settled it was the settlement of the argument and he said oh God let it be known this day that you are the only God in Israel and I am your servant and fire came down from God drinking up 12 barrels of water consuming the sacrifice and in order to preserve truth in Israel God did something strange that day he said let not one of those false prophets escape Elijah couldn't kill them all by himself I don't think so well maybe uh, God has ways of doing stuff and then he said to Ahab hurry up now that falsehood is out the way hurry up now that man-made doctrine i see the sign son i see you telling me it's 12 37 i hear you hurry up so i'm gonna hurry up now that falsehood is dethroned now that the doctrines of mankind has been successfully challenged 
He said, hurry up. God's getting ready to send rain. I haven't forgotten the main point I want to leave with you. That in the midst of the divine purpose, there is something called human perplexity. So a word comes from Jezebel, a threat to Elijah. He who moments ago was standing on the Mount of Carmel, declaring in fiery judgment, in unshakable confidence, now his human perplexity, like an erupting volcano, spread its ashes like doubt over his spiritual, mental, and religious horizon, and he found himself in a cave. From Carmel to a cave, from the mount of divine purpose to the cave of human depression, he was not just in the cave, he was deep inside the cave. And God had to use an earthquake and a storm before the still small voice. Someone's listening to me right now, someone's watching me right now, you're in a cave, a cave of your own making. Sometimes we get into caves because we fail to focus on God's purpose for our lives. Sometimes we get into caves because of our reliance on other human beings. Sometimes we get into caves because we tend to think that our protection, our defense, our safety is dependent on the inner circle. But your inner circle can stab you in the back. Your inner circle can let you down, but God Almighty will never let you down. Watch the question in the text I read to you earlier from 1 Kings 19, 13. What doest thou hear? I don't think Elijah was doing anything. I don't think the emphasis on the text was on the word doest. I think the emphasis was on the hearness of his presence. How did you wind up here from there? How did you get from Carmel to this? Elijah was borderline suicidal, so depressed. God asked him, What are you doing here? How could you get? here how could you wind up here I'm talking to a new believer I'm talking to an old believer I'm talking to a pastor I'm talking to a young professional I'm talking to somebody remember when you and God had this loving relationship. Remember when you and God could do anything. Remember when you didn't need anybody. You didn't need any friend. You didn't need anybody. You were satisfied that you and God could handle anything. How did you wind up here? Believer, how did you get so discouraged, so depressed, that getting up is not on your mind anymore. How could you wind up so depressed, so mistrusting that you are like steep steel, never trusting anybody again? What doest thou hear? And sometimes our depression can lead us to the place where we abandon the very purpose that God has for our lives. I wish I could finish the word today.
but my time is gone. I wish I could finish the word today. There's somebody listening to me. You're tired of crying yourself to sleep. You're tired of trusting people because everyone you trusted failed you. You're tired of taking people into your inner circle because they've let you down. There's somebody listening to me right now where you have vowed that you won't trust anymore. You smile in the day when you're in the crowd, but you cry at night when you're by yourself. All because maybe you have friends who before your face, they will pat you on the back, but behind your back, they will stab you in the eye. And you wind up in a cave. Elijah, I want to read something for you. It is from the expository file of Sewell Hall, 1996. And I, I want to read a little more, but I don't have my glasses, so let me see if I can read this. He said, 1 Kings 19 reveals Elijah in the cave of despondency. Well, he might be. Nationally, Israel had forsaken God's covenant. The very foundation of her national existence. Religiously, they had thrown down God's altars, slain the prophets with the sword. Personally, Elijah felt alone as one who was zealous of Jehovah and he was a hunted man they were seeking his life Elijah desperately needed renewed assurance of God's covenantal victory Elijah desperately needed renewed assurance for his role in God's purpose. Elijah desperately needed a resurgence of his spiritual energy. And so God comes to his cave with a question, what doest thou here? I'm going to have a song for you. When the song is through, I lift a prayer for some discouraged heart. A friend of mine called me on Thursday morning or Friday morning. And it baffled me that sometimes you lock yourself in moments where you share neither with wife, husband, nor children, nor work associates that which bothers you deeply. But God has a way of communicating to others your dreams like Nebuchadnezzar your thoughts like Nathaniel before I saw you under the fig tree I knew you God understand your thoughts I told you I wasn't going to rush today I told you I'm in no hurry somebody's spiritual life hangs in the balance I don't know which continent you are joining us from. Somebody's spiritual victory now trembles in these moments. You've joined the church with a freshness and a fervor. You've joined the church with a kind of vim and vitality. But maybe you've been let down by others maybe you the expectations you had might not have been realistic but they were yours anyhow the truth is there are many reasons that plunge us from the mountain of carmel to the cave of despair and every man's depression is real and should not be trivialized but i come to your cave I come to your room. I come to you, sir, in your car. I come to your young man leaned up against the street side watching me on your phone. I come to you, young lady, in the depths of your destitution. 
I come to you, you who have grown tired of your tears. You've wet your pillow with liquid frustration and you've grown sick and tired until you become numb. There is no feeling anymore. You've lost all sense of feeling because you just don't care anymore. But God asked me to ask you one question. What are you doing here? It's the hereness of your doing. It's the hereness of your presence. If I have to cut out the mentorship program, I'm not going to rush this one. It is the hereness. I don't know who you are, but the Holy Ghost tells me there's a battle raging. There's a battle raging in somebody's heart. I'm praying in my heart. I know what it takes. When God asked a friend to call me, locking myself in my own room, looking at all the stuff and asking God why and where and how. But one call came. Could I be the one called to you in your cave just now? Could I be the one called to you, sister in your cave, brother in your cave, professional in your cave. Could I be that small voice? What are you doing here? Here in your depression. Here in your brokenness. Here, you are in a crowd, but you feel so alone. Here, when there's, the devil said, there's, there's nothing more to live for. There's no one else to trust. Here, in your brokenness, when all the things you thought you could give your life to and give your life for can't help I'm going to ask them to sing a half of the song then I'll pray with you don't move Life is like a mountain railroad We turn engine air that's brave We must make the run successful From the cradle to the grave Watch the curve, the fields and tunnels never falter, never faint. Keep your hands upon the throttle and your eye upon the rail. Blessed Savior, Thou will guide us till we reach that blissful shore where the angels wait to join us in Thy praise for Standing Jordan, swelling tide, you'll behold the union 
and deeper unto which your train will glide then we'll meet the superintendent God the Father God the Son we extend Dead hands will greet you. We repeal grim welcome home. Blessed Savior, thou will guide us till we reach that blissful shore. Where Join us in thy praise forever, more forever, more. We sing the final part of the song. The text said Elijah was a man subject to like passion. The Bible tells us that Christ came as the God-man. Does it seem strange to you that Christ on the cross of Calvary would find reason to recite Psalm 22 verse 1? Does it not seem strange to you that he who is all God and all man in the moment of deep agony would pray, take this cup from me? Can you hear? Christ reciting in the midst of the darkness of Calvary. Psalm 22 verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In his cave, Elijah needed a divine revelation. And here comes God with a question, an encouragement, and an assignment. The question, how did you get here? The encouragement, I'm here with you. The assignment, go anoint a new king. Anoint a new prophet in your place. And oh, bless God, I close by telling you that even in your cave, God never abandoned his own for his purpose will be fulfilled. It's after the cave. He gave him an assignment to anoint a new king, anoint a new prophet. And when he was through anointing a new prophet, God sent a chariot from glory coming down to earth. And when Elisha saw the chariot, Elisha, Elijah's successor, he cried out, Alas, my master, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof and a fiery chariot come down from glory to take the man from the depths of his cave to the heights of hallelujah from the depths of his cave he mounted a chariot that carried him all the way past the sun and the moon and the stars up into the kingdom of the Lord God and when Jesus needed some encouragement whom did God send? He sent Elijah and Moses hallelujah there's an answer of encouragement in the still small voice if you can hear his voice if you can see God's hand the battle is not over you can still shout swing low sweet chariot after COVID, swing low, sweet chariot. After lying and slandering, swing low, sweet chariot. You may lose your job and lose your friends and lose your health and lose all earthly ties. 
but swing low, swing low, swing low, swing low. Then a chariot of angels led by Jesus for the sky shall roll asunder. The eastern sky shall part asunder and somebody who's been in their grave and in their cave will shout right on King Jesus, right on King Jesus from Carmel to the cave. The divine purpose though perplexed by human perplex hallelujah hallelujah God's will will be done the everlasting gospel shall be preached the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdom of our God I'm done As we stroll across the threshold, spanned in joy and swelling tight, you'll behold the union depot onto which the train will glide. There we'll meet the superintendent, God the Father, God the Son, we extend dead hands will greet you. We repeal grim welcome home. Blessed Savior, thou will guide us. Till we reach that blissful shore Where the angels wait to join us In thy praise Father and our God, we thank you for a powerful word today from your throne. We are glad to know that you are still master of ocean and earth and sky. They all shall sweetly obey thy will. So Father, I pray now that you will break the drought for somebody. Rain on somebody's turf today. And we pray, Lord, that it will be abundance of rain. Let someone can rejoice because you have done something miraculous in his or her life. And we will only give you the praise and the glory. And as the preacher said, Lord, we look forward to the day when the eastern sky shall be rolled back as a scroll, when the trumpet shall sound, when Jesus, our Savior, we shall see, when the mossy old graves where the pilgrims sleep shall be open as wide as before and the millions that sleep in the mighty deep shall live on this earth again. When those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet you in the clouds. When we shall change from mortal to immortality, from corruption to incorruption, where we shall live with you forever. This is our prayer with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. His voice makes the difference. When he speaks, he will relieve our troubled minds. Oh, yes. Let me tell you something. It's the only voice I hear and that you will ever hear that makes the difference. Mm -hmm. All you have to do 
is follow it one day at a time. If you're in your cave of despondency oh, this yes. morning, this afternoon, today, yesterday, or you will be tomorrow, just know that when you hear that still small voice, it's the voice of God that's talking. And if you listen, mm -hmm. then he will lift you up. After all, Elijah was lifted up Amen. by the chariot of fire. There's, oh, a, yes. there's a good end to the story. Hope. Hope yes. in the coming of, of the, the Lord. Lord. We yes. hope that your hearts would have been blessed today as Denise and I were. Denise. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Indeed so. And you know I get excited about the word. And I hope our viewers, you are excited as well. Whether you're in your, your living room, your bedroom, your kitchen, just get excited for the word of God. Oh, and yes. remember, be the minister of the gospel and always share the link because someone out there needs this end time message. Of course. And so on behalf of the entire West Jamaica Conference team here, we are saying to you until 2 o'clock, mm -hmm. which is just a few minutes from now, yes. we are asking you to stay connected. connected. healing of her dreaded disease her money brought physicians but only Jesus could bring relief and though her last thread of hope it was warm Jesus till she could touch him with her hands cause when you're hanging by a thread still you can climb life's mountain though the cliffs are rough and jagged you can call Once 
Thank you. 